Matt Zian. Welcome to the Thought Room. Thank you for having me. <laughs> this has been such a long time coming. Mm-hmm. Can't remember when you had me on your show, Zian Archive. Yeah, sometime early. No, maybe mid to late last year, I'd say. Yeah, that episode was, I believe, someone's going to fact check me on this, but I believe that was the first episode that we ever aired mm. on the Thought Room that was from somebody else's oh, cool. show. It's and an it was because I just loved what we did there. Mm-hmm. And you are such a talented interviewer. And I felt like you were able to showcase aspects of me and my life that as an interviewer, I don't always share Mm. when when I'm the one pulling the story out of others. So thank you for giving me that gift and that opportunity. And if anybody hasn't already checked out your podcast, I'm going to encourage them to check out uh, Zian Archive, which is X-I-A-N. Thank you. Uh, Yeah. Check it out. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that people who enjoy the topics of the show We'll, f- we'll find, especially after listening to what we're going to talk about today, yeah. we'll find much alignment. Totally. Yeah. If you like plant medicine and consciousness exploration, entrepreneurship, wellness practices, that's definitely what <clears throat> the main topics are on my show. Mm-hmm. And it goes all over the place, but that's kind of the, the core. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So you are a man of so many things, but before we hit record, you used this term that I loved, which was, you said, yeah, that was really my introduction into psychedelic media. Mm -hmm. I was like, ooh, psychedelic media, let's go there. And I know that you have some some stories too about how you get into such a unique Mm. niche space and what interests propelled you to uh, to make a life and a career out of psychedelic media. Right. So I would love if you'd kick us off anywhere your heart feels sure. called to start. I'd love to, yes. Um, yeah, so to kind of rehash the story I was sharing before we started the podcast, um, I began taking a, a really serious interest in psychedelics after what I call my awakening which was when me and a handful of bandmates ate too many psychedelic mushrooms. Not really. Too many? Yeah, and we didn't really know what we were getting into. Tell me tell me too many. Um, <laughs> just 3.5 grams, okay. but, but they were particularly potent mushrooms. They weren't thin uh, stemmed. They were very thick stemmed. Uh-huh. Um, I think they were probably penis envy. Uh-huh. I'm not certain because I was much younger and I didn't really... <clears throat> know the styles and the kinds and the strains back then. So thicker stem. Mm -hmm. It has more psilocybin. More potency. Yeah, more psilocybin. More of the um, serious psilocybin because the caps kind of, you know, someone could definitely fact check me on this, but in my experience, the caps feel a little funner, a little more lighthearted, a little Uh more heart-centered. Okay. And the stems feel a little more serious. Wow. So you're… You're like tuned into the energetic of the different components mm-hmm. of this little fruited body. Yeah, but well, we've experimented over the years. So sometimes it's like, hey, let's take just stems. Hey, let's take just caps. Wow. And the just caps, I feel like, yeah, it was a lighter feeling. Mm. Um, the stems were always like, what have we done? You know, <laughs> in a good way, but in a serious way. We're like, holy shit, yeah. you know. Um But yeah, so we had that experience and it really put me in touch with a dimension I'd never known existed, which was the spiritual dimension. And um, all I could think about after that experience is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Like, what was that? Because it's not leaving my memory. It's not leaving my interest. Like, it was the most interesting thing that had ever happened to me. How old were you? I think I was 19, maybe 20. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so about 10. 10 years, 11 years. Yeah, I'm 31 now. Mm -hmm. So with that interest peaked, I just started discovering as much media as I could that shared information on what psychedelics are, what they do, what spirituality is, how do you embody it. And uh, I found um, one of my favorite films of all time in the psychedelic sphere, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, which... Back then, it was on the front page of Netflix. So literally, you, I would open huh. Netflix on my PlayStation as it was like an app. And uh, it was like one of the first things I saw in documentary. Um, 
DMT, the spirit molecule. And I was like, oh, I need to watch this. So I did. I loved it. Super profound. It aligned a lot with my experience that I had with psilocybin. And I just became a fan of the film. And um, as a fan of the film, I wanted to see what the creators of the film were posting. So I went, and this was back before Instagram. So Facebook was like the main social media platform. And I followed uh, DMT, the spirit molecule on Facebook. And, you know, maybe a week, maybe two weeks after I followed it, I saw this post come out that said, you know, attention, Austinites were looking for an intern to help with social media, with event production, send your resumes to this email address. And I took an interest immediately. I was like, okay, like I'm the first person to click like on this post. (laughs) It happened, it said like just now, which I don't think we see anymore. (laughs) Um, But back then it would say just now when a thing was just posted. That was when the feed was actually uh, like by the time you posted it was what was at the top, Uh not not an algorithm, you know? Yeah. Um, Which I actually really preferred that. Right. Um, but anyway, I was the first person to hit, hit like on that, probably the first person to email. And then a week later, I had gotten the internship mm-hmm. to work in this field, psychedelic media field, um, with the director of the film, Mitch Schultz, who became a great mentor to me, um, a great friend, a great brother as well. And uh, he pretty much showed me the ropes as to how to take content creation to a professional level. It was something I had been doing already through YouTube. Um, I've been a YouTuber since I was like 10 years old. So I had a channel already with like 15,000 subscribers Wow! by the point that I had reached out to him. And he was like, you know, here's what real cameras are. Here's what real editing software is. Right. This is the people that have the information that you're seeking. Wow. Um, And I just got a crash course in, you know, how to be a a professional filmmaker, which I'm still learning to hone and harness um, to this day. But um, it was very inspiring work, and he definitely like opened the floodgates to me and my um, what I thought was possible, um, which is you can make a career out of the very thing that interests you, mm. which previously I was like, I, it didn't connect the dots between my interest in psychedelics and a career, mm-hmm. because of course it's illegal for the most part, and it's kind of um, taboo, and I just didn't really see it as something you could actually make into a career. But after meeting him and his friends in the industry, um, I realized you could make this career. So I started doing that. Mm -hmm. And now that's grown into like a conglomerate of things. I Mm -hmm. know you you have Time Wheel. You can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Do you do you know, animations? Do you DJ? Mm -hmm. I know that you have dabbled in a variety of things. So what has that expanded to for you now? It definitely started with music. Um, I was taking my experience with psychedelics into the musical realm, creating sounds that felt reminiscent of a psychedelic experience, drawing words from that experience we created three albums as a band something fiction Um, and then after around that point we were making friends with so many different musicians that we said let's make an artistic collective out of this and start throwing shows together with this theme of boundary pushing art Um, Mm. and we did that and to the point that we made so many friends that we had pretty much like a roster for a record label so we were like let's bind all of us as artists and make a record label. Um, we learned how to distribute music and, you know, share it far and wide through social media marketing. And we did that for a number of years. Um, that evolved into many things from festivals that I've thrown to just like monthly showcases to more recently ecstatic dance, which came out of a journey as well. Um, which came I, out of a journey. Um, so ecstatic dance, I didn't, know what it was. Yeah, explain it for those who haven't done it. Ecstatic dance, I like to say, is hooking your nervous system up to the music and allowing the music to move you. You're not trying to dance. The dance is just dancing itself, in a Mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Now, it came out of a journey because we had uh, done, me and a couple of close friends did a uh, heart medicine ceremony, MDMA, and we found this playlist on YouTube um, I think the artist is Moe's. 
And he was playing this, I think it was called like cacao vibe or something like that at um, this beautiful overseeing um, venue that oversees a lake, I think in Costa Rica, I believe it is. And it might be Guatemala. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But um, the way that these people were dancing, it just reminded me of yoga. And I was like, wow. And I totally breezed over the fact that I got certified to teach yoga as well as part of um, my path of discovering energy and how it moves through the body and stuff. But in this ceremony, we saw the ex- like the baby of yoga and my and music, my love for music and my love for yoga combining in ecstatic dance. And we said, this is what we need to do next. You know, like this is what is calling. Um, And then, you know, not but three months later, we started doing ecstatic dance here in Austin and we did it for over a year now. And Which are great. And I go to all the time. I'm glad you like it. Your sets are incredible. Thank you. Um, Beautifully. You know, and, and we'll have to we'll have to give your SoundCloud here mm-hmm. too in the mm-hmm. show notes so people can grab some of your sets because mm-hmm. they're really, really dope. But I love hearing you talk about you use the phrase like creating sounds that are reminiscent of the psychedelic experience. Yeah. Yes. And that thing that you said after the mushrooms, it was like there was this imprint on you that you couldn't shake even mm-hmm. though it's it's almost like the feeling for me that there's something in the back of my mind that I'm supposed to remember. Mm-hmm. It's just like this pervasive mm-hmm. pulse of this other energetic. And it's true. Like sound, I believe when you have your first psychedelic experience and then especially as you go deeper into the subtleties and the nuances of that space, sound completely changes yeah, for you. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of things change for you, but right. the, my experience of sound has completely bloomed open in yeah. the last five years in, in this wild and wonderful way. Yes. And I see more and more and more people having that pop up. Like as they begin their psychedelic journeys, they're like, I had no interest in making music and now I just bought all this equipment or right. just bought this instrument and they're, they're just like propelled to understand yeah. sound more. And I feel pretty confident that our collective understanding of sound is a technology of the future, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. To self-heal, Mm -hmm. Um, to change our brainwave states, Mm -hmm. to regulate our nervous systems. That's why certain music makes us feel certain ways. And it's a beautiful thing, you know, as I've been going through processing my my uncoupling with my partner and it's like a serious relationship. You live Mm. with someone for over a year, you do medicine journeys and… Uh, one of the first things I did was (laughs) create a playlist on Spotify, you know, called Healing My Heart. And it was just an intuitive curation of songs that would make, would bring me through the gamut of emotional experience from Mm -hmm. allowing myself to feel like anger and regret and sadness and then beauty and gratitude and appreciation to be able to have the whole human experience and not just Mm -hmm. breeze past it. Cause I think that's where the gold is. And I've watched you in that space be like a shaman of sound. <laughs> That's really what I think DJs are. Yeah, they're complete sound shamans. And totally. you ha- have, and I'll, I'll throw this over to you in a second because I'd love your take. But you have the ability to shift a collective energy that's right in front of you in this little yeah. microcosm. And it's like, do I want to bring everybody up, yeah. or do I want to take everybody? down into their bodies, into their own space? Or do I want them to bust open and feel social? Mm -hmm. That's such power and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And and it has to be such an amazing feeling to to stand up there and feel and watch the energy of a room shift because of what you are playing. Yeah. It is so fun. It's so fun. Yeah. Um. Yeah, in that psychedelic experience I was talking about, my awakening, I realized how important music was to me, to my friends, to humanity. 
I almost felt as if it was the most important thing. Like the most important thing. Like imagine a world with no music. Right. That would be a weird world, yeah. you know? So, and also the music was what was carrying me through the experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ayahuasqueros know this too. That's why they do their ikaros and they sing. And mm -hmm. they know that it has power to journey, to carry you through these experiences, through these other planes, these other realms. Right. Right. Because that's what sound is. Mm -hmm. Sound is a vibration. And we are living in a quantum field that is just made up of vibration. Mm -hmm. um, we, we forget that sometimes, mm -hmm. but even the air around us is it's vibrating particles, even though that's invisible to the naked eye. There's definitely sensory systems outside mm. of the five senses. And yeah. I think this is another thing and like synesthesia and all of this that you kind of stumble upon when you start having deeper psychedelic journeys is, oh, okay, there's much more here than the hologram being projected back to me based on the, the perception of these five senses right. there's a lot more beyond <clears throat> yeah not only is there a lot more beyond metaphysically but even with the awareness that you get from using things like psilocybin lsd mdma dmt like these help you hear even way more detail in the songs that you've heard a million times mm -hmm. like i've heard things that i never once heard in a song i thought i knew like mm -hmm. through using these i was like I know this song inside and out. And then I would hear it on psilocybin. And I'd be like, what is all that? Like, <laughs> that's buried in there too? Like, yeah. I just heard stuff I've never heard before. Right. So, yeah, it, there's so much even in the music we already know even to be discovered. Yeah. You know? mm. So, I love music. It's, it's my passion. And that's why I've thrown myself into doing it in one form or another, whether I'm actually producing music, I'm helping people that produce music, I'm doing a DJ set for ecstatic dance, I'm performing, I'm singing, I'm dancing. Music is really like, I feel like my calling and my, my purpose here is to help um, create it, foster it, share it, you know? Mm -hmm. I would say you're definitely on the right track, my friend. That's awesome. It's great to see you shine. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. So you you mentioned working with Mitch, and what what have been some of your other career highlight projects? Some of your favorite things that you worked on mm -hmm. thus far? So many, so many. It's crazy. Um, definitely through working with the Spirit Molecule, a floodgate open to the psychedelic industry, and I've worked with so many things from. 10 other psychedelic films that needed help distributing through social media, um, just needed guidance. You know, like one of them, for example, is A New Understanding, The Science of Psilocybin, which is an independent documentary out of Austin mm -hmm. about the power of psilocybin. Um, one was uh, Aubrey Marcus's Ay Ayahuasca uh, and Wachuma, which I did editing and distribution for. Um, also there was one called From Shock to Awe, which was, oh, yeah, I saw that yeah, one. yeah, which was based around veterans and, uh, them being healed by both ayahuasca and MDMA. Another one is The Way of the Psychonaut, which is, a uh, based on Stan Groff's work. Yep. And, uh, it's pretty much like a documentary about his life and his work and how it kind of impacted the life of the filmmaker and, um, Susan uh, Hesloger, which is, she's amazing. I was just on a call with her yesterday. Um, those are just a couple of the films. And then it, it branched into podcasts. You know, I, I made friends with uh, Michael Phillip from Third Eye Drops, who we now kind of distribute um, on our website for him. Um, he's an amazing podcaster. I've worked with him, um, Mike Adelic, you know, Mike Brancatelli, uh -huh. um, Radio Amenti, the, who is uh, hosted by Jennifer Sodini. It's just like everything just started finding me all at once. Yep. <laughs> and, yep. and then that's, you know, not even touching the music and how many releases I've supported through the label, um, whether we signed them or just like kind of collaborated with them. Um, we've done, you know, 50. To, no, I think actually we're past 100 releases on Timewheel as a label. So all of this can be found on timewheel.net. Like everything I've worked on is up there. There's just so much. There's just so much. But, um, 
it's just an honor to be able to do what I love for a career, you know, to make money and not dredge through the day and like, oh, I don't like this project, but I'm working on it. Like I've loved every project I worked on, um, which is really like a gift, you know, like I'm so grateful that that has unfolded for me. If somebody listening to this right now is feeling uber jealous of your life and just going, oh my gosh, I'm working on so many things that I do not want to be working on. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem possible for me. That Mm -hmm. seems like it's lucky or it's possible for some. What wisdom, information, reassurance codes, if you will, yeah. could you could you download here for us so that somebody who is ready to begin making that transition into their soul expression as career, um, mm-hmm. what would you say to them? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> and it's it's a tough one to answer because so many people I've noticed as I share this information don't know what they're passionate about. Ooh. But that's the hard one, though. But once you find what you're passionate about, you just have to be serious about it, you know? Question. Do you think people actually don't know what they're passionate about? Or do you think they're so blocked mm-hmm. around the allowing of the truth of what they're actually passionate about because yeah. they don't think it's rational that they actually suppress it so deeply? Yeah. that, And then there's a lot of chaos because we're trying to seek the thing that will make us money. And we're right. like, well, no, that thing's a hobby, you know? And yeah. that's why that age old question, you know, if, if money wasn't a factor, what would you do? Yeah. But people viscerally often don't believe that it's possible. Yeah. It's definitely possible, but it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but also, you know, what we would refer to as the matrix is this maze that keeps us so busy and distracted that we can't even hear those inner yeah. callings. You know, so really just like detaching yourself from all of that noise and getting really clear with you and yourself is what psychedelics offered for me. But you can do it without psychedelics. You can do it with meditation. You can do it with contemplation, going into even a, what are they called? The sensory deprivation tank, Mm -hmm. um, the float tanks. Those do it too. There's so many tools. Breath work. Breath work, yoga, sauna. Ice bath, all these tools can get you clear in your own inner dialogue and not so distracted. And we just, we live in an age of distraction. Um, So it's very hard for people to listen to themselves for (laughs) more than a couple of minutes without wanting to be entertained by something. Yeah. But that's what it takes is getting clear on what you love, what calls you, what you would do for free. And you have to start there. Um, doing it for free, investing in yourself, investing in your career for those opportunities and those doors to start opening um, for paid gigs in in that field. Um, It's really tough, but it's really worth it if you're able to do it. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. So I'm really feeling super called to dig even deeper to your personal story Mm -hmm. and One question I've been asking myself a lot lately is what are the themes that the universe is repeatedly bringing me? Mm -hmm. If I zoom out from the perspective of and look look at my entire week, for example, Mm -hmm. where was I looping or where did certain things happen that could potentially be unrelated, but my mind is drawing lines between going, oh, it's that thing again, or Mm -hmm. here's this pattern. For me, there's a lot coming up around um, receiving, Mm -hmm. you know, practicing receiving and Mm -hmm. noticing my body's resistance to receiving and then riding the waves of grief. When I realize that, like, why are you having a hard Mm -hmm. time feeling deserving or Mm -hmm. receiving right now? And then themes around how that connects to parents and early childhood and what my relationship was with my father. So there's like a lot of layers coming out for me that feel very clearly connected. Mm. Is there something vulnerable or not vulnerable, but these tender parts tend to be pretty vulnerable that's been coming up for you as an area of challenge that we could sit here and and mirror back to each other a mm. little bit on? Challenge, yes. I 
have a hard time saying no. <laughs> because I find so many things find me that the, the version of me that was 18 and itching for any opportunity yes. would say yes to. Yes. And I'm all, I feel like it's so hard to say no to beautiful opportunities. It's something I've been struggling with for so long um, to the point that it, you know, <clears throat> brings... I'm not able to bring my all to the things I really want to bring my all to yeah. because I'm so split into 10 different things. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. That's a tough one. Ooh. Um, so here's a question. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling about what it is, but when you say no to a potential opportunity, what is the fear? What's the fear that actually keeps you from saying no? There's a voice that's telling a story, and the story is? Hmm. The story is this is uh, an amazing project, an amazing person, and I would love to... There's, a, there's probably an element of people-pleasing involved in it. Uh -huh. I would love to help them. I would love for them to think of me highly. Yes. Um, yes, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a struggle because I'm a creative person. I feel like I have a gift at manifesting creative projects pretty quickly, pretty easily. And it, it's not a struggle for me to think creatively at all. Like I hardly deal with writer's block or a way to get around a problem. You know, I, I feel like I'm a problem solver in the creative sense. Um, and I feel like I can help people and I want to help people. Like it's, it's an earnest um, <clears throat> effort that I, I want to help people that need my help. Do you feel disappointed sometimes when you have to say no? Yeah. I do. I definitely do. It's, I do. I feel like I'm failing people sometimes. Too. Yeah, yeah. And especially especially if it has to do with like people that listen to the show or people that send me messages. Cause in the beginning when it was like super grassroots, I, I could answer yeah. all of those messages. Right. And so now I'm like, wait, I've gotten this to a level of success that I've now made it impossible for myself to keep the pulse on everything. Mm -hmm. Is this, am I succeeding or failing? Like what's, yeah. what's going on right. here? And I have a fear of growing it bigger cause I don't, want to deal with that crippling feeling inside of myself like I'm not there for the people yeah. that I want to be there for and I'm not accessible. 100%. I deal with that as well. Um, <clears throat> and I, I recently, only in the past year, heard that we're really only capable of, and I don't remember the exact number, but it's something like keeping contact yes. with a certain amount of people. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to say like, 50. Yeah, I was going to say it's like 40 or 50. Yeah. That sounds accurate. Um, yeah, but there's also this part of me that has taught myself to like think limitless. So I can often think these rules don't apply to me, <laughs> but they do. <laughs> right. And it's been tough realizing that they do because I feel like, Hey, I've gotten this far thinking limitless. Let me just keep thinking limitless and not put a cap on what I believe I'm capable of. But as things do become overwhelming, you know, I have to learn to listen to my body and what it's experiencing, whether it be stress or anxiety, and take a step back and learn to say no for my own health because otherwise I'm just going to burn out. And I've done that a number of times. And it's like... That sucks because then you feel like you're failing people even more because right. you've, you've committed to these things now and now uh -huh. you can't do it and or you're taking longer than you thought or right you know these types of things and it's it's definitely uh, learning um, a big thing I'm learning right now which is how to be okay with um, what is yeah you know that's why I really resonate. In recent years with the Tao Te Ching. Yeah, I'm reading it now. So good. Yeah. And it just helps me not want to keep pushing the needle further, further, further. Like right. I have good intentions by doing that, but I'm also like learning 
that you can only go so far. And the rules you hear about do apply to all of us, you know, mm-hmm. like just because I can think limitless and have a, an ability to creatively problem solve doesn't mean that I'm exempt to stress and anxiety, yeah. you know. What's coming up for me is that it feels like there's a connection here with the energy of excess Mm -hmm. and scarcity. So I see that energy in people that maybe have a scarcity layer or mindset that they're, they're not actually even really conscious that they are because there's so much in, in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I am speaking from personal experience where I'll just fill space. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's like, it's like there's never enough. There's never enough time. Yeah. And turning down an opportunity means potentially I'm missing out. Yeah. And I'm missing out because I have limited energy, right? Mm-hmm. And then I get to be in that story of myself. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, if you just could do more, then you could do all of this <laughs> right, stuff. Right. Like, why don't you just do better so that you can do mm-hmm. everything? And it's that addiction, yeah. that emotional addiction to feeling that scarcity always there. Yeah. Yeah. I relate a lot to that. Um, <clears throat> I'm also, yeah, like because of what you said, I find myself in a hurry in things I shouldn't be in a hurry to do. Like when I go eat lunch, like there's this mission I'm on to get in the restaurant eat as fast as possible, get out of the restaurant and back to work so I can keep doing these types of things. And that's not healthy. No. (laughs) You know, like you should enjoy your food. It's not good to scarf it down. Like I've had to learn that more recently and slow down. And because I'm causing my own stress by thinking that I'm doing something extra productive. Yeah. And then Um, your body's like, I can't digest this much food this quickly. Yeah. I think about if you went to lunch with a friend and you ate like that. I do that. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. guys. <laughs> but like, I think about this with my body sometimes because I do the same thing. Mm-hmm. I try to be better about it and I have gotten a lot better over the years. But sometimes it's just like, oh, shoot. Sorry, body. Like, I really was not even breathing while I was eating. Mm-hmm. I was not aware of you. I was on my phone, like, mm-hmm. eating this sandwich <laughs> with crumbs like everywhere and mm-hmm. <laughs> just like wake up in the aftermath of yeah. you know being an, a complete gremlin that's just out of my body and if you if we're eating it's like we're we're on a date with ourselves mm-hmm. we should be present yeah with each bite mm-hmm. yeah. ideally mm-hmm. and chew our food that's yeah. a big one yeah it's a big one <clears throat> and give thanks to the food you know More or less say a prayer. Yeah. Thank you for this meal. Yes. And I didn't do that for a very long time, for many, many, many years. Like growing up, I, of course, like I only looked at that at first as like a, like a Christian thing to do. Right. I grew up in the Catholic church and stuff before I kind of found myself being more agnostic because I'd never had a direct experience with God. So what am I even believing in here? You know, Uh it's like, uh um, and then coming more in touch with my spirituality through psychedelics and those experiences and what it's taught me, I now see the power in giving thanks for the mm-hmm. food and more or less like putting intention into the food before you eat it. And it's not something I'm perfect at. I don't do it every time. But when I find myself in that rush state, I'm, I have to talk myself down a little bit. Yeah. It's like, okay, dude, chill out. Yeah. Give thanks to this food right now. Eat it slow. Enjoy it. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is what life's about. You know, yeah. like food's a big part of life, yeah. you know? And I totally was just disconnected from that part of my life. I just, I was almost like, I'd prefer to not have to eat so I could do all the stuff I want to do, right. you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to tell a funny thing about um, one of my previous partners when I lived in New York was mm-hmm. like, I was always trying to tell him to nourish his body. Mm-hmm. And I remember one day he came to me and he was like, oh, I found the best thing. They're like these diet supplement drinks. They have all your calories and you just, you mm-hmm. don't even need to eat. Now I can work all the time. And right. I just looked him in the eyes. I was like, that's horrible news. Right. That's, that's yeah. the opposite of what we're talking about here. But, yeah. um, when I was living down at Soltara uh, for for those three months as I was launching this podcast, 
a lot of the facilitators and staff had a practice of kind of giving their food some Reiki. Mm -hmm. It was very new to me when I went there. I had experience with Reiki, but not watching people give energy to their food before they consumed it. And so, you know, then I, of course I start doing it and I think of that famous experiment that everybody probably knows and has been repeated a million times, but with the rice in the jar. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one that I heard of is they did it in a classroom and they put two jars full of rice and a little bit of water and they had the children Mm -hmm. say loving things Mm -hmm. to one jar of rice and then say hateful, horrible, discouraging things to the other jar of rice. Mm -hmm. And after like a month, the the love jar was still impeccable. Like the rice was white. Mm -hmm. And then the other jar, it was like all moldy and like yellowed and kind of like mushing together in this mash. So how do you explain that? A couple Mm -hmm. jars of rice that are a few, you know, feet away from one another. And to throw it back to what we were talking about in the beginning, which is vibration. Mm -hmm. And like our word, our intention in the word and our energy, yeah, and our just our energy itself. That's why the Reiki over the food works, mm-hmm. you know. And and even for the most skeptical person, like even if you're just very agnostic, you know, scientific, you, we can agree that there are particles and waves, yeah. and <laughs> we totally. can look to quantum physics for explanations of why these things actually work. So I think my takeaway that I would like for everyone, no matter what your belief system is, is what is my intention Mm -hmm. in doing this? When I consume this piece of food, am I doing it because I waited so long and now there's an ache in my belly and I just need that to shut up. So I'm going to jam this down really quick. Or this is my temple. Mm -hmm. I want to nourish it. Right. I want to spend time with it. This is this is another way I love myself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, in referring to that experiment, you know, where <clears throat> the rice stayed better because of the positive vibrations mentally that were sent towards it, I I believe that you know, the human machine is so much more powerful than most people know or give credit to. And, you know, really only these heightened states of consciousness can help us see exactly how that is and and how powerful our intention is and that it does impact things from a glass of water to your meal to the medicine that you're going, you know, like I like to say a prayer before I do a medicine journey, like with whatever it is, a mushroom, a tablet, whatever it might be, to just kind of infuse intention into that. And that's a tried and true practice for thousands of years because it works. Right. (laughs) It Like something subconscious in there does change what happens when you either eat it or intake it or drink it or whatever it is like it really works it's it's beyond kind of our ability to prove it's just something you have to believe or because it's happened to you yeah you know it's a it's an experiential knowledge thing um that definitely comes up as something that i think not a lot of people connect with daily i didn't for a long time but also the idea that our body is our temple um, really resonates. And I'm not in touch with it all the time, but certainly during these heightened states, you know, usually through plant medicines or um, a meditation or a yoga practice, I get the firsthand experience of my body as my temple. And then it recharges that um, inspiration for me to treat it as such, you know, <laughs> like, After weeks and months since a journey, sometimes it does, the dial turns back down and I see my body as my temple less. 
Mm. And that's when I'm starting to see like, oh, it's time for another journey maybe, or it's time to integrate a bit further, or it's time to read another good book to help instill this. Because it's an ongoing practice. I don't think enlightenment is something you get once and for all. I think it's like you keep returning to it over and over and over. It's a cycle. Yeah. Um, and but once you do realize your body is your temple, it is your house. It's what houses you. You're, you are your consciousness. You're not your body. You're the spark of consciousness mm-hmm. inside of yourself. Yes. Um, that's, you know, like worth a billion dollars to know, I think. Money can't buy that knowledge. You just have to find it in the way that you find it and that works for you. But once you do... Um, it's hard to forget until, you know, as I said, the dial will never never completely turn off because it's in our memory. It's like burned into our memory that like we've had this experience of knowing that we're so much more than we appear to be. But it can, it can lower in volume. Um, and the, the challenge and the practice is to keep it up. Like, yes. and, you know, daily practice helps with that. Like having a morning ritual, like, you have discussed even just today, like wanting to kind of like keep the your space uh, this morning, like to make sure that you could show up today on the podcast yeah. in the way you wanted to. So we pushed it back a little bit. Yeah. Totally respect that. Um, I've done the same many times. And yeah, well, that, yeah, I'll throw it back to you real quick. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot there. Beautiful. Yeah, there is so much there. Mm hmm. A body as a temple. Yeah. <clears throat> so the next thing I want to ask you about is I know you love mystical yeah. experiences mm-hmm. and the mystical. And I wondered if there's one particular favorite story or potent titration of learning that you'd like to share with us today Mm. around one of your mystical experiences or even someone that you know, a story that really sticks out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for myself, um, I find mystical experience is like the protector of, protects you from getting oversaturated with the matrix (laughs) and depression, anxiety, anything that's kind of like making you take life for granted. The mystical experience to me makes life worth living. Mm. It is like a core pillar of my life. And I can tell the lives of a ton of people that came before me because all the books that we have about the mystical are a thing for a reason. Like it would have faith, like the Tao Te Ching would have phased out by now if it didn't ring true to humanity for <laughs> a long time. <laughs> yeah. um, a ton of mystical texts exist that have st- stood the test of time because the mystical is, the mystical experience is what binds all religions, mm. all spiritual traditions, um, all mystical texts. From, I feel like everyone's touching on the same experience and they're just kind of filtering it through their cultural filter. Yeah. You know, like <clears throat> they're trying to say the same thing, but because they grew up in certain societies with certain languages, they can only say it this way. Mm-hmm. But it's all the same. Like they're all touching on the one, the, the one, like the, <clears throat> the unity experience, the, the unitive consciousness experience where we see all as one, that we are equally a part of nature um, and we're not separate from it. Mm -hmm. You know, we are a part of it and that's, it can't be be taught. You just have to have that experience. Um, But for me, it definitely came with psilocybin in the woods where I could feel the energy, the infinite energy of nature and that I was a part of it. Um, the trees felt in this mystical state like highly advanced mm. technological beings mm. 
And it's funny because we don't think of trees as technology. We think of a MacBook as technology. But, <laughs> right. but they are. Yeah. They literally are the highest form of technology that let all of this happen. Yeah. Without the trees, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. Like they transmute the carbon dioxide into oxygen to let us be here. I yeah. feel like they're holding space for this whole thing. Oh, yeah. And that's the mystical, you yeah. know, like we can't get in touch with the trees as these powerful ultimate beings unless we're in a mystical state, really, unless maybe you've got a gift. Maybe some people can. Yeah. I couldn't. Mm-hmm. I talk about how I was almost blind to trees, blind to nature right. before this experience. Right. I would not see them. I'd right. be driving down a road and there's thousands of them passing me by and I didn't see any of them. Yeah. Like after this experience, I see trees as beautiful yeah it's just like i can't even say the words i'm like why am i so enraptured by this tree yes it is so like i have the same thing yeah it's shocking one of the coolest things is to take a little mushrooms and then be walking through the woods Mm -hmm. and look at the personality yep. of the trees. 100%. They're so different. Mm-hmm. Like some of them have like young kind of sprightly energies and yep. then other ones are like old and some feel more grumpy and some feel more welcoming. 100%. And it's like, whoa, where was all this information before mm-hmm. I had the psilocybin? And, yeah. you know, we come we become so numbed off to it. I actually have a dream of someday because I love taking woods photography. It's just like this mm-hmm. random... Thing. I just I see these little vignettes that are very human esque in the woods, okay. and I'd love to to do like a little coffee table book that's like the personality of trees 100%. and just capture. So if anyone wants to fund that book, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like you know the personality of these trees, mm-hmm. and then write poems um, alongside them. Thousand trees percent. are amazing. Thousand percent. Yeah. Some of them, and you know, like people do know this, and they've. It's so funny because like then it makes me think who else knows this and who designated this as like a sacred area where buildings can't be placed. Like other people do know the importance of trees and nature and preserving it. Um, And I think, you know, the highest to those people because without them, we would just have a freaking concrete jungle out here. Mm -hmm. But someone is out there holding space for these, for nature and trees and saying, no, you cannot come in here and build buildings. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we have national parks. We have, um, you know, normal parks that aren't national parks, just like local parks and these types of things. And some are better than others. But I do thank, you know, um, them for making sure we have access to deep nature in safe ways because it's super important. Um, but, yeah, I've, I've felt those personalities too. I see the difference in how they grow. And I actually just got back from Sedona and um, yeah. I, I noticed, and because I, I had heard to look out for these, but these like um, twisting trees. Like, yeah, like near the, the vortex. Right, the vortex is very much making these trees grow in these like spiral patterns. Yes. I took a ton of pictures of a bunch of trees that yes. you just don't see them like that around here. Um, and they're very powerful, but... I definitely feel like trees have almost telepathically communicated with me and gave me like ancient wisdom as well. So much that you can't really put into language. It's just an experience you have. Um, And it's beautiful. And that's why I write songs about it. You know what I mean? um, Because it can really only be expressed as poetry or song um, because it just doesn't make sense logically. But it's an experience that... I feel like most people can have and would benefit from having, you know, as long as you're doing it safely and with respect to see yourself as a part of nature and not separate from it Mm -hmm. because that makes life feel so much more sacred. Yeah. You know. And what does the world look like when more of us have that feeling Mm -hmm. that we are viscerally connected how does that energy express on a macro scale with mm-hmm. more and more conscious individuals saying the resources are not finite, mm-hmm. pa- the power is not finite, mm-hmm. we can share this, 
I don't need to take from you. We can give to each other Mm -hmm. because we're all connected. And how does that change the very fabric of this dimension that we're in? Yeah. You know, with enough intention. Yeah. I, you know, I know a ton of people don't have really a positive uh, vision of the future. Yeah. They think we're going to kill ourselves pretty soon. Yes, they do. Um, I personally really like to think of us, our generation, um, as the people that will essentially like alter the timeline. Right. To bring nature back to the forefront. Um, And these teachings and these practices and these things we've been disconnected from in American society and culture um, back to the forefront so that we can remain humble and grateful and preserving of nature and just living better lives without stepping on each other and stuff and like trying to like do one over on someone so that you can win and all this and that. I I don't know. I, I have a positive feeling that our like even this act right here we're doing with this podcast and like spreading the information, even if just one person hears it and gains from it, it's worth it. Yes. And um, yeah, I, I just really feel that just in the way that the generations that came before us kind of made the earth feel um, like it was having a destructive pattern onto the world and that we were going to more or less need to leave the planet. Like people are planning to go to Mars because the earth's going to run out. Right. I don't feel like it's going to run out. (laughs) I feel like it's seen so much more than a case of the fleas, which is what negative humans are. Yeah. And it's been here and it's going to find a way out of this. And it calls to it the people to protect it. Right. And we are those people. Yeah. You know, like it comes through the message of the plants. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> That's powerful. It's coming. It makes me emotional. <laughs> I love it. It's beautiful. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, we we are the the holders of the line of hope. Yeah, we are the stewards. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. And more and more people are getting turned on every day. Yep. And that's why I love being involved in the psychedelic media world because it's helping. Because there's, you know, just as equally a non-psychedelic media world that's hurting. Right. But slowly but surely, it's going to catch up and I think overtake the narrative that this is important. Um, these medicines are important. These practices are important. And it is. I'm seeing it on the front page of Times now. Yeah. It used to not be like that. Mm-hmm. We see... Weed, you know, cannabis plants in the HEBs right. on the front cover of magazines. Yeah. And cannabis is just the introductory one. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we're seeing MDMA next, if we're seeing ayahuasca next, if we're seeing like, yeah, the 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 big publications sharing this information finally because we're finding out anyway. <laughs> right. So it's funny how I kind of see that happen where I'm like, in my mind, I go through the little mental gymnastics of like the what the publishers thought when they were like, oh, we have to finally comment on this because to not makes us look not hip. Right. You know? So true. It's That's such a hilarious uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> little oh. irony there. But yeah, I see it too. And when I was down at Soltara, there was a photographer and a journalist there from the New York Times that wrote an article on veterans and Mm -hmm. ayahuasca. And that was really cool to see. Um, Dear friend of of mine, Joe Hawley, just had a feature about like his men's work Mm -hmm. groups Mm -hmm. in men's health. Mm, You know, and and it was, yeah, we talked about the article too, because I was like, how'd you feel about that? Mm Because when you get like a mainstream outlet like Men's Health, Mm -hmm. there's going to be like a particular slant and they, you know, might not really get Mm -hmm. uh, what we're doing here. And I was just so proud of my my friend Joe for putting himself out there because I think sometimes 
like with this work, I'm like, oh my gosh, do I want to be featured that much? Do mm-hmm. I want the scrutiny of it? Mm-hmm. Can we just stay over here and just yeah. quietly whisper to my little thought roomies? And mm-hmm. um, but but I feel that call. I feel that that dragon inside of me being like, it's time to breathe <laughs> fire on everything. Calissima. Yeah, exactly. That's and funny. Um, so that's definitely waking up inside of me uh, totally. this year and. It's just, it's interesting how all these worlds are colliding at this time. Yeah. I feel like all of that, you know, for example, like the media attacking Joe Rogan recently is. Oh, yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. It's them in the war, more or less, of this conscious um, media that is slowly but surely infiltrating the masses. So, so. For those who didn't really weren't really hip to what was happening with that, I heard they went back into like some of his old content. They did found some racist comments, yeah, from like a long time ago, and mm-hmm. then were using it effectively like as a smear campaign to personally discredit everything he's talking about mm-hmm. right now, which is really important, mm-hmm. the stuff that he's talking exactly. about right now. Right. So, yep. I, is I that heard, accurate? Um, I believe so. And I'm not super up to date on it. Um, I did follow the story a little bit. But <clears throat> one of the things that I try to think of is that he is a comedian. And... I don't know if you've ever been to comedy shows. I have. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that. It's not just Joe Rogan. Yeah. It, you know, a lot of it is poking at these sensitive things culturally. Right. Um, for awareness, maybe a laugh. Maybe it's not funny. Maybe it bombed. I don't know. Right. I, I wouldn't do it. But, right. but he's a comedian. So, like, for people to, like, start thinking of him as… Right. I don't know, Socrates or something. That's not who he is. It's not who he's trying to <laughs> it's be. It's not who any of us are. Right. It's not who any of us are. And I think here's here's a differentiator. If something like that is brought to somebody and they, you know, I'm I'm trying to put myself in his shoes. If if people mm-hmm. here's the fear. Okay, so let's say the thought room starts exploding even more and mm-hmm. then in four years, somebody wants to comb back through my old content and just mm-hmm. pin me for something. Like, that's a horrible feeling. What would I do? I would listen to the concern. I'd listen to the complaint. I would mm-hmm. pay attention deeply to what was happening inside of me. And if if that rung true as something maybe I couldn't see at that time, was there an integrity check there for me? And then if it felt relevant, I would make an apology mm-hmm. as he, as Joe Rogan has done. Right. So if somebody, you know, we all would have skeletons in our closet. If somebody really wants to take any of us down, like mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> you've been on social media for since you were mm-hmm. <laughs> young enough that people are going to find something from the last, sure, sure. you know, 20 years. And um, so, so what's important to me is that this man took responsibility mm-hmm. And even even if he had some activations around what was being said, he was like, okay, I see what you're saying. And yeah. he didn't get defensive, for at least from what I saw. I can't really, I didn't, you know, in full disclosure, I didn't, I don't care about these things enough to really dive deeply into them. I feel mm-hmm. a lot of them are distractions. Mm-hmm. But pay attention to that. Like yeah. if somebody is getting canceled and somebody is getting put on a chopping block, Notice the grace Mm -hmm. with which they take that versus some other people who will just edit out any content or comment that Mm -hmm. even remotely vaguely paints them in a negative light Mm -hmm. or it won't even let you post content that paints them in a negative light or you, there will be repercussions for you. Mm -hmm. Or like what happened in Canada is if you donate to this the truckers, oh, right. your bank account's gonna get frozen. Right, right. Like, let's just pause and look at that mm-hmm. for a moment. And are we running around like chickens with our heads cut off, just so afraid out of our minds that we're looking for anyone to blame mm-hmm. for the chaos and discord that we're feeling within our own bodies and our own nervous systems? <sighs> right? Yep. Yes. A thousand percent. 
Yeah, there's yeah a couple of things come up there. Um, one is that regarding Joe Rogan and what I would recommend to anyone going through something similar is own up and take responsibility. You know, like it's not a hard thing to do. One of the biggest turnoffs that I find in other people is when they just point the finger at someone else all the time and never take accountability, never take responsibility for their own actions. Mm -hmm. They just say, no, you, so it's back to you now. They point the finger back always and won't ever say, I did say those things and I'm sorry or whatever. Okay, here's a, I want to unpack this Mm -hmm. because this is one that I'm working on too where I had a, I had a mentorship call with Neil Donald Walsh, the Mm -hmm. Conversations with God Mm -hmm. author. And one of the questions I asked him was about like fielding projections Mm -hmm. and not taking things personally Mm -hmm. because I, as an empath, as a sensitive being, when people give me feedback, I really want to listen. I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh, maybe there's growth for me in, in this. And sometimes I can take that to the extreme where I get watery boundaries and I start to esponge the projections as truths and I get a little like lost in who I am. Mm -hmm. And then I can ping pong to the other side and someone gives me a piece of feedback. I'm like, no, it doesn't resonate. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's there's a little harshness or an edge there where I'm like, no, that's your stuff. Mm -hmm. So where is this middle space in between? How can I fine tune my system to know when actually an apology is needed and when an apology is not needed, Mm -hmm. I simply can offer empathy to the person who's having the emotional experience. Right. I mean, what comes up for me is that if someone says something, it's their experience. Even if you didn't intend for them to have that experience, they did. And that we could take accountability for... I didn't mean to make you feel that way, but don't not acknowledge that they feel that way. Mm -hmm. So we do acknowledge that something we did made them feel that way and apologize for that. And right. But that doesn't mean that 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 right. That doesn't mean that now you're bad. It just means that there's like a miscommunication happening. And so let's scenario, let's play this out. So, um, so you did something to hurt, whatever. Mm-hmm. I feel hurt mm-hmm. by something that you did. Mm-hmm. And I say, Matt, I really don't like how, well, if I wanted to blame you, I'd say how you made me feel. <laughs> right. Right. And <laughs> when I'm on the other side of that and someone says that to me, I don't like how you made me feel. Mm-hmm. My brain immediately goes, dude, only you can make you feel a certain way. <laughs> and that's like that's like the thing. Where's the balance? Because right. we can we really make somebody feel another way or do we provide the stimulus for their response? And the same stimulus might, in a different situation, provoke a completely different response. For example, mm-hmm. we're supposed to meet for lunch mm-hmm. and I'm running late and I text you. And I'm like, sorry, Matt, I'm running late. And you're like, oh, fuck, Callie's always running late. Like she's just da 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 right? And you get upset. And then I show up and you're like a little bit passive aggressive toward me, right? Mm-hmm. Same scenario. I'm running late. I text you. Hey, I'm going to be late. You're like, oh, thank gosh. I'm running late too. Mm-hmm. No worries. I'll see you in a bit. Mm-hmm. I didn't make you feel Right. A certain way. Mm-hmm. You made you feel a certain way based on how you were interpreting what I did. Mm-hmm. The story around it yeah. either brought you um, into a fear of like I wasn't valuing your time or I didn't respect you or I was just a, a mess and that kind of person triggers you versus oh, this is divine alignment. We're both running late. Mm-hmm. I'm so supported by the universe. Right. So where, what, like, how can we get into these nuances to know how to attune to others and when mm-hmm. an apology is warranted, when a boundary is warranted? Yeah. Unpack this with me. 
<clears throat> I want to give kudos to Corey Allen for this quote because he had posted something not long ago that I thought was brilliant. And he said something along the lines of, um, love, no, no, no. He said, um, boundaries. Oh God. He said it so good. Um, I don't really remember the exact quote, but it was like being able to maintain or put up boundaries without withholding love. Mm, yes. So yes. do what you need to do, but don't withhold love so right. that it's not this like punishing spite, energy. spiteful, pun- yeah, punishing energy. Right. It's like this or is… Or shaming your, energy. Yes. Like, um, like you should feel bad for having that reaction. I'm not going to take responsibility for how you're feeling. I right. see that. I see that. Mm-hmm. So like with love. Yeah, with love, maintaining the boundaries that you feel called to maintain. And that can be whatever it is that you feel needs to happen between you and that person. You can say it in a way that does not withhold love. Mm-hmm. And that was really brilliant. Um I don't feel it's appropriate to go digging through Instagram right now to get the quote right, but it, it's a great quote. Go check out Corey Allen and read all his stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But another thing that comes up is I identify with two um, famous thought systems. One is the Tao Te Ching and one is Stoicism. Mm-hmm. And both kind of teach that there are things in your control and there's things out of your control. Uh-huh. And to let things out, well, first of all, learn how to identify what's what, which is, for example, do you control the traffic? No. So why are you upset that the traffic's bad? Mm-hmm. You know, like that's something out of your control. There's no reason to get upset for things out of your control. Um, the Tao teaches the same thing. It is what is. Like you can complain all you want. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. So accept things as it is, as they are. And you will have a better reaction, right? both internally and externally with what you say to other people. But it does all start with you, you know? Um, so if something's running late, is that in your control? No. So why are you going to get mad at it? Right. You know what I mean? What is that? Is this the Lord's Prayer or something? It's like, oh, to, like the second part's like to accept the things that you cannot change and the wisdom to know the difference. I forget yeah. the first line. That of sounds, it. Yeah. That sounds like it. And it's a it's a practice. Um, no one's going to be, unless you're allowed Zoom, maybe 100% able to do that at all times. But the practice is to return to that as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and also that brings up the concept of us creating our own suffering. Yes. Suffering is self-created. A large majority of it, I'm not going to say all of it, uh-huh. But so much of it is the stories we tell ourselves causing our own suffering. Right. If you're able to do or or practice stoicism or the wisdom within the Tao Te Ching, you'll be able to, yeah, identify things that aren't in your control and not get hung up over them, get upset over them, get your heart rate beating over them, yeah. and just remain in the Tao. You know, it's the meaning that we create around what's happening. Mm-hmm. It's not actually yeah. what's happening. Right. It's what it says about you mm-hmm. generally or your lack or how you're not showing up or how you're not doing enough or how you're not going to be safe or your family's not going to be safe and therefore you're not a good provider. Yeah. Or, you know, you don't know how to discern good friendships and that's why this is happening to you. Or mm-hmm. the world's an unfair place. Ooh, that's a that's a big one. Mm-hmm. That's one way to completely disempower and victimize yourself is to just tell yourself <laughs> that this is all random and I have no control. And I mm-hmm. this is I am I'm a victim to mm-hmm. the breezes of chaos that are gonna fly through my life and one of my biggest takeaways from my ayahuasca ceremonies was around free will. 
-hmm. And I spent a lot of time and ceremony asking to be taught about free will, which I believe I understand is one of the sacred governing laws of the universe. Mm -hmm. When we violate other people's free will, we create really intense karma Mm -hmm. that will have to be reckoned for. This can be done through violent, abusive, overt Mm -hmm. ways or subtle, manipulative, Mm -hmm. even well-intentioned influencing sort of ways. Mm -hmm. And what I understand about destiny, you know, are are all the events of our life lined up Mm -hmm. and we really have no say? Okay, that's one school of thought. Is everything really happening for us? I believe yes. Now I believe time and timelines are malleable. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we can shift very quickly and we can choose. Well, I think that we came here to learn a certain curriculum. Your soul did. Mm -hmm. My soul did. Right. Now how quickly I move through that curriculum or how gracefully Mm -hmm. that is my free will. Mm -hmm. But the curriculum that my soul wants to learn, those lessons are predetermined. And I can learn them through career. I can learn them through relationship. I can learn probably through all Mm -hmm. because it saturates. These, These threads are all connected and they are not mutually exclusive. I mean, if everything in the universe is connected on a macro level, then everything within you and your personality and Mm -hmm. your psyche and your shadow, it's it's all um, connected. So the free will comes not necessarily in regard to the curriculum that we're here to learn. It comes in our selected reaction Mm -hmm. to how the curriculum comes. Do you receive it like a humble student? Mm -hmm. Your prerogative. Do you kick and scream and fight and resist? I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. There's a part of me that's still addicted to that melodrama. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I got to love that part too. Mm -hmm. You know, the the highs and the lows. There's a part of me that really likes to ride that emotional roller coaster and try and just understand where she came from. Mm -hmm. You know, what was her history? What was her childhood that made her a little bit comfortable with extreme Mm -hmm. and volatile and painful. Mm -hmm. And can I bring in compassion for that? And am I willing to consider a different way? Does my nervous system need to still do that? And it's Mm -hmm. okay if the answer is yes, for as long as I need. Mm -hmm. Um, It's important that I select the timeline where I'm not shaming myself. Right. And, and and the Buddhists call that the second arrow mm-hmm. where it's like you have the original thing and then you have like the guilt and shame for you feeling the way that you're feeling about the thing, yeah. which only more deeply entrains you into that victim right. rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. So much there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I feel like You know, I think of this Buddhist concept um, that says we chose the lessons we're here to learn before we incarnated. We chose the parents that we were going to have to teach us the lessons we need to learn for our own karma and our own karmic path. And this is just one of many lives I'm not someone who can remember my past lives. So it's not like I have this proof. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> but stay open to I, infinite possibilities. I do I, I do believe in this concept that yeah. we're here to learn the lessons we chose to learn because we failed to master them the last incarnation. Mm-hmm. And really, this is just a journey of evolution to get better, better, better as a soul. And we're incarnated in this particular circumstance, set of circumstances, because we signed up to be. Yes. And, you know, and if you're just to think of um, what it would be like to be unincarnated, 
we would get bored after a while. Oh, yeah. And we would want to be like, you know what? Earth sounds pretty fun. Let's go learn some lessons, you know? Because you'd just be an infinite time and space for infinite time and space. And you'd just be like, well, this is all and everything. And wow, cool. But like, I want to learn some lessons and have some relationships and like feel something. Completely. You know? I spend some time in a place that I can describe as nothing else but the void Mm -hmm. in some of my ayahuasca experiences. And it was like beyond, it was oneness, but it was beyond oneness. And I don't even know how to explain that. But this infinite hollow Mm -hmm. of perpetual moving, unmoving and moving existence. And I thought, Wow, I totally, it was the deepest seated loneliness I could ever right. explain. It was harrowing mm-hmm. because there was nothing separate from me. Mm-hmm. There was no me. There was nothing to perceive. Right. There was nothing to be experienced. I had everything. Mm-hmm. There was nothing to long for and everything to long for. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, this is, the divine creative principle. This is why, why polarity. This is why separation from God yeah. because creation is, is infinite once we separate from the source mm-hmm. <laughs> and you watch how life wants to unfold and dance and create and spiral when it's, trying to find itself home when it's trying Mm -hmm. to find union and all the beauty and the propulsion and the repulsion and the dying Mm -hmm. and the growth and the decay that happens in this infinite dancing loop that we are as we try to understand ourselves as God. Yeah. Yeah. A thousand percent. Um, I had a, a similar experience it was one of my earlier psychedelic experiences with actually salvia, Ooh. which is widely misunderstood <laughs> because of <clears throat> the YouTube videos that sensationalized it and made it look kind of stupid. But it is a very powerful entheogen and it can show you how you would give anything to get back to all the struggles Mm. and all the earthly matters because it's so much better to be here experiencing that than that void. Yes. You know? 100%. Yeah. So we're grateful for our struggles. My arm, the hair on my arms is standing up. Yeah. It's so true. It's like, Please just get me back because I feel to alive. my depression. Because we, <laughs> you know what I mean. Because we get to experience, yeah, and then you get to grow, and it gives you the opportunity to see what's possible. And yeah, yes, it just makes it such a really unlanguageable amount of gratitude. Yes, for our normal daily life. Yes, <laughs> yes, beautiful. Yeah. Wow, Matt. Yeah. We're here to learn some amazing stuff. We just got to stay keen, you know? Yeah. I'm so glad I have you in my life. <laughs> Thank you. Likewise. I, I'm so glad for our friendship and, yes. and it's it's blossomed over the last two years. And I'm so glad that you're mm-hmm. we're close by each other and you're in Texas. And Absolutely. I know we will have many more of these. Let's do it. These episodes. Because they're, they're powerful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. I would like to ask you where people can find all of your magical things online. Any links, mm-hmm. any social media that you want to send us toward? Yeah. Um, the main platform is Time Wheel. Um, we're on Instagram at Time Wheel. Our website is timewheel.net. You can find my podcast and the podcast of my friends and colleagues and collaborators on the site, um, as well as a bunch of the music that we produce. Um, my personal kind of podcast is uh, Z and Archive, as you mentioned earlier, X I A N Archive. Um, I'm on Instagram at Z and Archive. And um, yeah, I'm on all the podcast platforms. And um, there's, yeah, that's, those are the big two. 
Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. I've loved having you. Yes, thank you. It's an honor to be here. <laughs>